Hello, I'm Rosary Pursuit, and today I'm reading the fourth part of 12 Degrees of Humility and Pride by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Chapter 8 The same sequence is seen in the rapture of St. Paul to the third heaven. Do you suppose that St. Paul had not undergone the same gradual process when, as he has told us, he was caught up in the third heaven? But why was he caught up instead of being led up? The reason, surely, was that if so great an apostle says that he was caught up to a place whither no teaching nor leading could bring him, I, who am certainly a lesser man than Paul, may not venture to think that I can reach the third heaven by any strength or effort of my own. So, may I neither trust to strength nor shrink from exertion, for a man who is taught or led is obliged from the fact that he follows his teacher or leader to use some effort. He at all events does enough in assisting his removal to the place or condition at which he aims to enable him to say, Not I, but the grace of God with me. But the man who is carried away not by his own action, but that of others, and without even knowing his destination, cannot take credit or any part of it to himself, since he accomplishes nothing, either alone or with assistance. The apostle might possibly have been directed or assisted to the first or middle heaven to reach the third one. He had to be caught up. For the sun is said to have come down from the purpose of helping men to rise to the first, and the Holy Spirit to have been sent to lead them to the second heaven. But the Father, though he always operates with the Son and the Holy Spirit, is never said to have come down from heaven or to have been sent to the earth. It is true that the earth is full of the mercy of the Lord, and that heaven and earth are full of thy glory. And to much of the same effect, and of the Son, I read, when the fullness of the time came, God sent his Son, and the Son himself says of himself, The Spirit of the Lord hath sent me. And through the same prophet he says, Now the Lord hath sent me and his Spirit. And of the Holy Spirit I read, The Paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Lord will send in my name. And when I have been taken up, I will send him unto you, with undoubted reference to the Holy Spirit. But though there is no region in which the Father does not exist, I find no mention of his own person anywhere but in heaven, as in the Gospel, my Father who is in heaven, and in the prayer, our Father who art in heaven. From this I unhesitatingly conclude that as the Father did not come down, the Apostle could not go up to the third heaven, nor does it see him, though he recalls that he was caught up thither. Moreover, no man hath ascended into heaven, but he that descended from heaven. And lest you should suppose that the reference here is to the first or second heaven, David tells you, his going out is from the end of heaven. And to this he was not suddenly caught up or secretly conveyed, but as is stated in their sight, that is, in that of the apostle, he was raised up. It was not with him as with Elias, who had one witness, or with Paul, who could have none, to attest his statement and who could wholly do so himself, for he admits, I know not, God knoweth. But as the Almighty, he descended and ascended as he pleased, and chose at his discretion the place, the time, the day, and the hour, as well as the onlookers whom thought worthy to be the witnesses of so great a spectacle, and 
While they looked on, he was raised up. Elias and Paul were caught up. Enoch was translated. A savior is said to have been taken up, that is, to have gone up by himself, without help from anyone. He depended neither on conveyance by a chariot or assistance by an angel, but on his own power. A cloud received him out of their sight. And what was the purpose of this cloud? Was it to help him in weakness, to stimulate him in slackness, or to sustain him when in danger of falling? Such ideas are inconceivable. That cloud received him out of the bodily sight of his disciples, who, though they had known him as Christ in the flesh, did not yet know him to be more than man. So, those whom the Son calls through humility to the first heaven, the Spirit brings together by love in the second, and the Father raises by direct vision to the third. In the first they are humbled by the truth, and say, in thy truth, thou hast humbled me. In the second, they rejoice together with truth and sing, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. As also it is written concerning love, it rejoiceth with the truth. The third heaven, they are carried up to the recesses of truth and say, my secret to myself, my secret to myself. Chapter 9 The writer sized regretfully over his shortcomings in the search for truth. But how can a poor creature like myself ramble on about the two higher heavens in a way more suggestive of the outpouring of words than of spiritual activity, seeing that it is as much as I can do to crawl on my hands and feet under the lower one, yet I have already, with the help of him who calls me, set up for myself a ladder to the higher level. I am moving in the direction wherein I may show to myself the salvation of God. Now I look upwards to the Lord, whose leaning over me. Now I spring forward at the call of truth. He has called me, and I have answered him. To the work of thine hands thou shalt reach out thy hand. Thou, O Lord, dost indeed number my steps, but I, slow climber and tired traveler, am looking for a resting place by the way. Woe is unto me if the darkness gets hold of me, or if my flight be in the winter on the Sabbath day. Yet, though now is the acceptable time, and now is the day of salvation, I delay to set forth towards the light. Why do I thus hold back? Pray for me, son, brother, friend, fellow traveler with me in the Lord, if such there be. Pray to the Almighty that he will strengthen my feeble foot, yet in such a way that the foot of pride may not come to me. For though my foot is feeble and unable to attain to the truth, it is more reliable than one which, when it has reached it, cannot stand therein, as you have it in the psalm. They are cast out and could not stand. So much for the proud, but what about their chief? What about him who is called king over all the children of pride? He, said the master, stood not in the truth, and elsewhere I saw Satan falling from heaven. Why did thus fall, unless on account of pride? Woe be to me if he who knoweth the high afar off should see me also indulging in pride, and should launch at me the terrible sentence, Thou wast indeed the Son of the Most High. But as a man, thou shalt die, thou shalt fall like one of the princes. Who would not quail before the voice of thunder? Oh, how much better it was for Jacob 
that the sinew of his thigh shrank at the touch of the angel, then it should swell, weaken, and perish at the messenger of pride. Would that an angel would touch my sinew and make it shrink, so that I, who in my own strength cannot but fail, may from my weakness begin to make progress. I surely read, The weakness of God is stronger than men. So also did the apostle, when he complained of the sinew which an angel, not of God but of Satan, was buffeting, received the reply, My grace is sufficient for thee, whom virtue is made perfect in infirmity. What is virtue? Let the apostle himself give the answer. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in mine infirmity, that the virtue of Christ may dwell in me. But you may, perhaps, not quite understand to what virtue he particularly alludes, since Christ possesses all the virtues. But though he has them all, there is one which he preeminently possesses, and specially commends us in his own person, namely, humility, where he says, Learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart. Gladly, therefore, will I glory in mine infirmity, in the shrinking of my sinew, that virtue, which is humility, may be made perfect in me. For thy grace is sufficient for me. When my strength has failed, I will then, by thy favor, put my foot firmly down, and though through its weakness I must move slowly, I will mount safely by the ladder of humility until, by keeping to the truth, I reach the broad expanse of love. Then will I sing with the gesture of thanks the words, Thou hast set my feet in a spacious place. Thus. By close and careful following of the narrow way, by a slow and sure ascent of the steep staircase, with steady but painful progress, I limp along until, by some marvelous method, the goal is approached. But woe is me that my sojourn is prolonged. Who will give me wings like a dove, wherewith I may fly more quickly to the truth, and so may rest in love? Since these are wanting, lead me, Lord, in thy way, and I will walk in thy truth, and the truth sh shall set me free. Woe unto me that I ever came down thence, for had I not foolishly and madly begun this descent, I should not have had this long and laborious climb. But why do I speak of a descent, when I might more accurately call it a fall? unless indeed, but because as no one comes at once to the top, but all have to go up gradually, so no one becomes at once utterly bad, but goes gradually downhill. Otherwise, how could the saying stand, the wicked man is proud all the days of his life? There are, in fact, roads which seem good to men, which yet lead to destruction. There is then an upward as well as a downward road, a road to good and a road to evil. Avoid the evil and choose the good. If you cannot do this by yourself, pray with the prophet and in his words, remove from me the way of iniquity. And how shall this be? He adds, out of thy law have mercy on me. This means by the law which thou didst give to those who fainted by the way, that is, to those who departed from the truth, and of these I, who have indeed fallen from the truth, am one. But does not a man who has fallen use every effort to rise again? For this reason, I have chosen the way of truth by which I may rise through humility to the place from which I fell through pride. I will rise, say I, and I will sing. It is good for me, Lord, that thou hast humbled me. The law of thy mouth is good to me, above thousands of gold and silver. 
David seems to have set before you two roles, which, however, you know to be one identical yet different, and called by different names, either that of wickedness for those who go down, or that of truth for those who go up. For you go up to a throne by the same steps which you come down, you use the same road for approaching or withdrawing from a town, and the same door for entering or leaving a house. In like manner, the angels appeared to Jacob as ascending and descending on the same ladder. What do these comparisons suggest? Surely, that if you wish to return to the truth, you need not look for a new and unknown road, but for the one by which you know that you came down so that you may follow your own footsteps and may humbly rise through the same degrees through which you fell and fried. That which was the twelfth degree of pride in your fall will be the first degree of humility in your ascent. The eleventh will correspond to the second, and the tenth to the third, the ninth degree of pride to the fourth degree of humility, and the eighth to the fifth, the seventh to the sixth, the sixth to the seventh, the fifth to the eighth, the fourth to the ninth, the third to the tenth, the second to the eleventh, and the first degree, the first degree of pride to the twelfth degree of humility. And when you have discovered and really recognized these degrees of pride in yourself, you will have no difficulty in looking for the path of humility. Okay, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, there is a link in the playlist in the description below. That is all, and may God bless.